You are listening to the Bethel Church Sermon Podcast, a ministry of Bethel Church in Yale, South Dakota. If you would, take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 12 with me. Romans chapter 12. We're going to pick up in verse 4. Let's stand together as we honor the the reading of Scripture together. I'm just going to start in in verse 3 because in verse 4, we see that word for again, so he's drawing from that. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, although many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith, if service, in serving, the one who teaches, in his teaching, the one who exhorts, in his exhortation, the one who contributes, in generosity, the one who leads, with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you so much for your word, this description of the church and and how it functions and the the way in which you gifted it and, and why you've done these things. And Lord, I pray that as we as we go through this and, and start reflecting on, on this portion of scripture, Lord, I, I pray that you would guide us, lead us into truth, that your spirit would just open our eyes, that we would just see the, the gloriousness of what you've done in your church. It's not like any other organism. Lord, we pray that, that your word would be something that is used by you this morning, that would prick our, our hearts Lord, we pray that you would put us on the the right path, give us the strength, the determination, the power by your spirit to to be obedient in areas where we might stray. Lord, we pray that we would always continue to look to Jesus, who is the the one who is the, the model for us, the one who died for us because we continually fall short of what you command of us. The one who has lavished his love and and grace on us when we were so unworthy. Lord, I pray that in our graciousness, in our gratitude for what you've done, that we would long to be obedient, that we'd long to live in community like you've designed. Lord, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Tom Wright tells a a story of seven friends. These seven friends met together one morning because they, they all discovered their shared interest in gardening. Their interest was so strong in gardening that they were ready to give up their current jobs. They were ready to to work together and and start a new business, a gardening center, because they believed it was needed because there wasn't one around. And they needed to meet together and decide how to get started. Who was going to do what? Now, Jeffrey and Ruth were natural leaders. And the group agreed right away that they would coordinate the the project. Jeffrey had contacts in the business world. He could talk strategy with people who would give them advice going forward. Ruth worked in the banking industry for 20 years. She would be an obvious choice to run the, the financial side of the business. Thomas, 
He could never really look after his own money very well, but he was very eager to get started. He wanted to grow vegetables, and he was delighted when the rest of the group agreed that he should oversee and be in charge of of that section of the gardening center. Rebecca was a gardener ever since she was little. She loved flowers and shrubs. So she was in charge of that part. Gary was a handyman. He could do anything. He could put up a fence, fix a lawnmower. He was such a needed addition to this gardening center. Matthew, he knew the country. He was in sales. He was the one who would get in his car, get out on the road, find new business for this new gardening center. But Richard, there was an awkward pause in the morning meeting. Wasn't really good with his hands. Mm. Loved gardening. I mean, he was excited about the business like the rest of the group, but where did he fit in? He had a, an academic background, but never really pursued it. He was everyone's best friend, though. Made everyone smile, and as the group sat there in silence for a moment, it was as if all at once the light clicked. He's the key person. He's the main office. He would greet the people. He was the... He, was the, he, would, he would greet the employees when they came in the morning. He would make the, sure that the customers were happy. This was right in his wheelhouse. And after meeting, the business was launched. And as they say in fairy tales, it was a happily ever after business plan. It worked. Certainly, the text that we read in Romans 12 he is speaking of the church, not a gardening shop. But I think you see the relationship to the text that we read. It was, it was precisely because of the group's unity around the gardening business and also their diversity of interests and talents that the business could even work at all. Speaking of the church in these verses, Paul makes it clear. We are one body. Twice he says that. We are one body. And this body has many members, and these members do not all have the same function. It it is a little interesting that the word church isn't used here. In fact, overall, it, it is surprising how little the word church is actually used throughout the entire New Testament. I say the New Testament because it isn't used in the Old Testament at all. The first time the word church is used in the New Testament is in Matthew 16, It's used again in Matthew 18, but not in any of the other Gospels. It's scattered 18 times throughout the book of Acts, which you would expect. We see it five times in the book of Romans, all in chapter 16. 1 Corinthians, Ephesians have quite a few references. In fact, in all, there's 79 occurrences of the word church in the New Testament. But of course, just because the word church isn't used doesn't mean the Bible doesn't speak of it. In fact, the doctrine of the church is discussed a lot. And often the the church is discussed with other words and other images, which is the case this morning in our text. In verse 4, it is clear. We're talking about the church. There's one body. This is a reference to the church. And this church has many members that do not all have the same function. We all have gifts, and these gifts differ, but they are precisely what makes us one. Grasp this. I think this is the the point of these verses. Yes, we're going to talk about spiritual gifts as we go. That's important here, but the main point of the text isn't for you to discern your spiritual gift. The point is the unity of the church and how it functions how it works. And Paul states clearly that we all have different gifts, and if we have them, we ought to use them. He says that in verse 6. Then what follows verse 6 is Paul giving a representative sample of gifts, and after mentioning each gift, he gives an admonition to use that gift in the church. That's how the oneness and the diversity function in the life of the church. Now, 
We said that this text was about the doctrine of the church, so we need to get on the, the same page here concerning what the church is. The word church is, is one of those words that's a, a little bit difficult because of how we use the word. Most of us know that the church is not a building, although we say we're going to church, meaning the building. The church is, is people. But what people? Are we talking about a particular congregation, a denomination? For instance, we hear of the Baptist church, the MB church, the Presbyterian church, and the list goes on and on. Are these church? Some would claim to be the true church. But even if some claim to be the one true church, could it be that some who claim that are not even the church at all? Does membership in an organization make you a church member? If that's the case, what about those who watch services online or TV who can't get out of the house? Does one have to be baptized to be part of a, the church? What if they're baptized but no longer attend? Are they part of the church? Of course, the list goes on and on of the questions that we could ask here. It's at this point that I think Paul's imagery here is very helpful. When he speaks of the body of Christ, he is speaking obviously of those who belong to Christ those who are joined to him in exactly the sense that he has already talked about in Romans 5 and in other places, where we're told that those who trust in Christ are reconciled to God through the death of Jesus Christ. Those who are joined to him, who are in union with Christ. The true church is a spiritual reality. It isn't something that we can see, but it is accomplished by the Holy Spirit. Those who are new creatures in Christ, those who have passed from death to life, union with Christ are part of this people. Chuck Colson said this in the book, The Body. He said, quote, the, the church, the body of God's people has little to do with slick marketing or fancy facilities. It has everything to do with the people and the spirit of God in their midst. Now we have alluded to this already, but it shouldn't go without saying here that strictly speaking, the church, which was created by Jesus from all people, Jews and Gentiles alike, is a New Testament reality. That's why the word is found only in the New Testament. It's why in Matthew 16 and verse 18, that Jesus said to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. Notice the future tense there. On this rock, I will build my church. And there's a great example of what the true church is in Acts 2, where people from a great many nations are brought to faith in Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God through the preaching of Peter at Pentecost. And the text there actually lists the places where these people are from. This is where the church started. In a sense, it isn't the... It is a little bit simplistic in a sense that the church is the community of those who have been called by God. And if that is the case, and if the Old Testament were believers, were saved by faith, which they were, then they too belong to the church of Jesus Christ. And this is because they look forward to a coming reality and were actually joined to Christ in faith. The difference between them and, and us is that we look backward, not forward. We're getting into some issues that we talk about in Romans 9 through 11, but for now, just notice a couple things. The church is a people, a people called by God, united to Christ by the Spirit. In other words, one cannot be part of the church in part of Christ's body, that's the imagery, imagery here, and not be a believer. Notice something else. And that is that we're not talking about local church membership. One can be a member of this or any other church and not truly be united to Christ. That isn't our hope. It's not our intention, of course, but it is a reality. The fact is, we take local church membership seriously. This is why we adopted a membership covenant as part of our doing life together as Christians 
And what is in that covenant is simply how the Bible describes Christians that gather in local assemblies, how they live and how they act toward one another. Certainly, regenerate local church membership is important. It's really important. In fact, membership in the local church, the local body is giving their stamp of approval that that individual is in fact called by God and united to Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. But I don't want you to get confused as to what we're talking about here in this text. We're not talking about local church membership necessarily. We're talking about what the true church is. It's made up of individuals who are called out by God to be a people of his own possession, who are united to Christ through his death and resurrection for whom the gates of hell will not prevail against. Let's look a little more specifically about about the imagery that Paul uses here. Paul is, is speaking about the church clearly, but the image that he uses is the body of Christ. It's interesting imagery. Christ's body is not only a, a community of those who have been joined to Christ, but we learn here that there is one church, and that is because Jesus has one body. We're all joined to him. Now we hear often about how the church is more divided today than ever before. That is simply an ignorant statement, one that is unaware of of church history and all the divisions in the church. It's a statement that doesn't focus on the fact that unity exists between the many churches and traditions that take sola scriptura seriously. When the church diverges from the doctrine of sola scriptura, everything else goes. I'm going to plug our our latest episode of, of Renewal Cast. In that episode, we talk about biblical authority. It's such an important issue today. A lot of what is being put out there on this issue, why the Bible is authoritative, some in our own denomination, it's heading down a very scary path. When we lose biblical authority and we don't understand the doctrine of Scripture alone, then there's many other things that are that are going to follow, and it is very scary. And yes, there becomes disunity between those who take the scripture seriously and see it as God's word, and those who just think it's good advice or water down inspiration or water down inerrancy. Inerrancy just means the Bible is without error. I would suggest that for those who hold to Scripture alone, not just in word only, but understand it, for those, there is a great unity in the essentials of the faith. A tremendous unity. So when, we, so when Paul is speaking of the body and the unity, he's speaking of the unity that exists between true believers in the church. I think at this point, it's going to be helpful to turn to Ephesians 4, if you would do that for a moment, we're going to spend a a little bit of time here. In Ephesians 4, specifically verses 4 through 6, I want you to notice the the unity here. Starting in verse 4, there is one body, right? Same imagery, we've already said that. And one spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. You, I'm I'm sure, notice right away why we turn to this text. You you see the, the seven unities that exist in this passage. Let's just briefly look at those. There, first, there is, there's one body. This is important for the church because it, it pictures it as something that is organic, something that is, that is living rather than a, a complex machine made up of all these individual parts. 
And I think that's so often how we understand the church. Yes, the church is, is one thing, like one car is a thing, but you have all these little instruments that are working independently of one another to make it work. And if one thing just goes awry, then you just replace it and get another and, and it all works. But that's not how the church is, is pictured in the scripture. It's not a complex machine. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Just hear this. Speaking of the church. But God has so composed the body, right? Same imagery. The church is a body. It's, it's amazing how much that same imagery is, is used over and over. It's, there's one body. God has composed the body, giving great, greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If another member is honored, all rejoice together. There's one body. We're all in this together. Secondly, there is one spirit. The word spirit in Ephesians Four is capitalized. So the idea is not a, a spirit of cooperation or something like that, that that unites us, but it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is at work in the life of the church, and he's at work in the life of the church, drawing us to Christ. I didn't ask Chet. I, I meant to, but I don't think he's going to mind this. Chet was was reading in, in Genesis the other day, and he, he called me, and he said that he noticed something really cool. He he was talking about how a certain passage in Genesis clearly pointed to Christ. He said it was so clear. It was amazing. The Spirit works that way. The point here is that we're all different. We all have gotten to to this point in our Christian journey in, in different ways. But yet the reason that we're here is the same reason. It's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God has awakened us to our need for the gospel. We've been made alive in in Christ, trust in him for our salvation. This Spirit continues to work in us. And we know that because of the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not a, a list of things that Christians ought to embrace in one respect. It's the fruit of the Spirit working in us. Third, there is one hope. The word hope today means something very different than it did in the Bible. Hope means today something uncertain. We hope for this, we hope for that. In the New Testament, however, it refers to something that is sure, something that is certain, but for something, but something we've, we must wait for. Paul calls this the, the hope because it embraces a, a unity among Christians that we hope for. We all together hope for the return of Christ. We hope for a, a future resurrection. We hope for the, the final judgment. We hope to, to live together with him in heaven. We hope for these things, to be free from sin, to be free from trial, where our bodies aren't falling apart and getting sick and ailed by all of these things. We long for that. There's, there's hope We eagerly wait for it. It's certain. We hope for it. And we do it together. Fourth, there is one Lord. Now, there's there's such thing as believing in a false Christ. I I would suggest like Jehovah's Witnesses, for instance, this is, they believe that, that Jesus is the firstborn, the first created being. That is unbelief. And there are some that proclaim a, a false Christ and, and, they're not, and when they do that, they're, they're not believing in the truth. I think the scriptures are clear. To trust in Christ is to take him as he says he is, to take him as he's presented in the scriptures. He is Christ and he is Lord. He is God. True Christians, the church agrees on this fact. That Jesus is God. He isn't a a manifestation of the divine, but there is no one like him. There's one Lord. 
I think here we should also say something briefly about the Trinity. I was listening to something the other day where a guy was asking some, some questions of another guy, and he, and he says, aren't we brothers? I deny the Trinity. I believe in Jesus. I believe in the Father. I believe in, in those things. I, I just, I don't believe in the, in the Trinity. I don't believe three in, in one. He was what they call a, a oneness Pentecostal. Of course, oneness Pentecostalism is a heresy that the church dealt with long, long time ago. It's called modalism, where Jesus, God, they just appear to be that and manifest that in a certain time. Modes. Can't somebody deny the, the Trinity? To deny the Trinity is to deny who Jesus is. Simple as that. It makes a mess out of the New Testament. It makes an absolute mess out of John 17. It makes a mess out of Jesus' baptism. It denies who Jesus is. He is Christ the Lord. Five, there is one faith. Faith is is one of those words that we've often used very subjectively. When somebody's going through something, we we say something like, well, you just got to have faith. Subjectively, we say it. But the word has an objective meaning too, and it refers to the, the content of our, of our faith. That is an objective thing. The essentials of the faith, that is an objective thing. It is the gospel and its teaching. And there is one body of genuine Christian doctrine. I'm not saying that our understanding of that is all perfect. It's limited for sure. But if we are Christians, our differences are in minor areas. It's by definitions, we must all adhere to the major doctrines. James Boyce says that in gen- a general rule is that we must explore the points in which we agree with others before we explore the points in which we differ. Good advice. The fact is, well, the, the fact is, the, the point of Romans chapter 12, the text that we're reading is, is this, I believe, that we're focusing on the unity that we have before the differences. I'll say this, though, that when we see a supposed believer who is drifting in an essential area, there's a, a duty to say something. And, and there needs to be discernment in this area. For instance, there are doc- doctrinal differences amongst Christians like if somebody believes that God created the world and it took longer than six literal days. Do we see that as somebody drifting in an essential area? I don't think so. But if somebody is flirting with anti-Trinitarian views, then we need to say something. Sixth, there is one baptism. I think it's interesting that baptism is included here. I would suggest that baptism, especially the mode, isn't necessarily an essential issue. Certainly, it's not an issue that all Christians agree on, sprinkling, pouring, immersing. What about those from a more Presbyterian tradition that baptize infants? But for them, it's not something that saves the child. It has to do with bringing them up in a a covenant community. Baptism is something that has divided denominations and Christians very greatly. But yet here... Paul is saying there is one baptism. There's no getting around the the division here. And those divisions are actually important divisions. But we need to understand what Paul is meaning here. He isn't thinking of modes of baptism. He isn't thinking of infants versus believers. He's thinking of baptism as the sacrament in which we are publicly identified with Christ Jesus. That's what baptism was in Paul's time. There wasn't a a discussion about how this is supposed to work. It was that you be baptized. In baptism, the believer identified with other believers. They take a stand. I don't identify with this guy. I don't identify with this guy. I identify with Christ Jesus. I'm taking a stand and I'm publicly demonstrating this. It's a public profession. 
saying, identify with Christ, and that happens once. There's one baptism. There's one moment where the believer identifies with Christ. That one public profession. Seven, there is one God who is father of all. One person pointed out that the first three in this list centered around the Holy Spirit. The one body, the one spirit, the one hope. The next three are grouped around Jesus, the one Lord, the one faith, the one baptism. But this last point concerns the first person of the Trinity only. And and the reason is that all of this was the Father's plan. All of this is an expression of the Father's decree. It was his plan. In Ephesians 4, 6, we read that he is the Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. All of this goes back to him. All of this in the life of the church. We hear the the call to unity all the time, usually from those who are well-intentioned but are a bit misguided. The call to unity, though, is is a good one. We read it all the time in the scriptures. Do your best to live at peace with everyone. I mean, we could go on and on about the calls to unity. But the difference here is that we are not called to create the unity of the body of Christ or throw essential truth out the window for the sake of unity. What we see in our text and others, such as Ephesians 4, is that the unity of the body of the Christ is given for those who are in Christ. If you're in Christ, there is a, a certain unity that exists in the body that we need to recognize. I'm not saying that we shouldn't work for a valid, invisible expression of that unity, but it's there. We're all united to Christ if we're believers. That's why I said the focus of the text here is on unity. That's how verse 4 starts. For is in one body. And it is in that body that we see different members. To understand the function of the members, we need to understand the oneness and the unity of the body. Does that make sense? It's only in the context of unity the one body that the functions of the members even make sense. Let me, just, let me just close with a story that was given by Donald Barnhouse in his study of this passage. He said once that he was speaking, he was giving a, a lecture, and, and during that time he, he spoke of a, a group, a, a denomination that was considered that he considered to be on the fringe of authentic Christianity. After his lecture, uh, a pastor from that particular denomination was, was in the audience, came up to him afterwards and expressed that he felt his, his assessment of that particular denomination was unjust. So Barnhouse apologized and asked if he could meet this minister and a few other pastors from that denomination for lunch. So they planned it. And at the lunch, Barnhouse made a, a suggestion that during the lunch, they only talk about points in which they agree. And after they were finished talking about the points in which they agree, they can turn to points to where they disagree. So they start the lunch, they start talking about Jesus, they talk about the virgin birth, they talk about Jesus' death, physical resurrection, the significance of those facts. They spoke of Jesus being God in flesh. They spoke of the Trinity, Jesus' present ministry, their hope for his return, glorious resurrection, The meal was almost over, and then they they turned to the items in which they disagreed. And as they started talking about the items in which they disagreed, they recognized pretty quickly that those were all secondary to the items that united them. They were important issues, but still secondary, and they recognized that they were areas in which they could agree to disagree without denying that the other was in the body of Christ or not. Barnhouse said later, and I quote, he said, though I'm separated by a continent, 
I have often prayed for these men, and I'm confident that they've prayed for me. We know that we are one in Christ. They made a distinct contribution to my spiritual life, and I contributed to theirs. I am the richer since I became acquainted with them. End quote. You know, we too often focus on what divides us and not what unites us. Our fractures, our divisions in the church are often over secondary things. Secondary things that matter, but they're just not seen in their proper perspective. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. In secondary issues, we need to give others liberty. That's the proper perspective. I think Paul in these verses is asking us to put things into the proper perspective. To think about what unites us. For we are one body. We are one. Think about that. Think about what unites us. For if we focus on secondary issues that divide us and we let those things start shaping our relationship with others, think about the ramifications of that. There's only going to be a small group of people that we're united to. And it's not going to be the body of Christ. The unity of, that is spoken of here is a unity that exists between everybody that is called by God and united with Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Union with all of those that is given to us, that we ought to seek a, a, a valid expression of that. Our union is with all of those, not a select few. Of course, some of this brings up a lot of, a lot of questions like, where is the line between essentials and non-essentials? <laughs> and, and sometimes that gets a little bit hard. When we talk about cooperating with others, where are some of those lines? Those are, those are difficult issues. But what we're talking about this morning in, in this passage is, is who is part of the body that we're united to and, and who's not. I mean, if we're, a, if we're a Christian, there is a certain unity that exists. We all have those things, those, those seven unities in that Ephesians passage. Our union was, was with all of those, not a certain few. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to this sermon resource from BethelMBChurch.org. If you'd like to learn more about Bethel Church or find other resources, please visit our website at BethelMBChurch.org. Bethel Church exists to bring glory to God by promoting the joyful worship of Jesus Christ both here and abroad.